Hey everybody, it's Jay Bear from Convince and Convert, joined today by a very special guest, Mr. David Meerman Scott, author of the bestseller, The New Rules of Marketing uh-huh. and PR. He joins us today. David, how are you? Good, sir. Hey, I'm good, Jay. How are you? Glad to see you have the third edition there, too. I do. I've got the most recent. It is the new, new, new rules of, of marketing yeah, yeah, yeah. PR. Yeah, Exactly. New, new, new. Third edition. One, two, three. <laughs> third edition is fantastic, right? It's like the Bible. It's crazy. It's it's amazing. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. I, I, I agree with you. It's kind of crazy. When I wrote the first edition, I was writing it in 2006. That was before Twitter, BT. You know, it's like way back in the dark ages. And I thought I had some good ideas. And, you know, there were a few people doing the sorts of things that I was talking about. Um, but I thought I was sort of a little bit niche <laughs> And, um, you know, and, and lo and behold, there's entire conferences and, you know, thousands of books and, um, and, and, you know, tons of people who specialize in this new form of marketing. It's pretty exciting to have been uh, very, very early in thinking, in, in seeing the trend. Well, you're on the right side of history. There's no question about that. This is true. <laughs> well, and, they, and they say, right, people call this, uh, you know, sort of a modern business classic. I mean, you've heard people say this. It's, it's you know, like the, like yeah. the, you know, like good to grade or something like that. I mean, that's got to be, um, as an author myself, I mean, that's got to be a, 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 an amazing and interesting feeling for you. You didn't set out to write a modern business classic. It just sort of worked no. out. No, no, it, it just sort of worked out. I mean, I, I guess what it teaches me is to trust your gut. You know, I when when I wrote this, um, it was a couple of years after getting sacked. I got fired. <laughs> I got I was vice president of marketing. And they weren't ready for the new rules. rules. They were ready for the old uh, rules. Exactly. I was I was vice president of marketing in a company called News Edge, which was acquired by Thompson Corporation. Yeah. And as part of the acquisition, they decided, you know, this guy's got some radical ideas. It's not going to work over here. So they. They, uh, they sent me along on my way. But that was a great thing because, number one, they sent me along on my way in a really crappy job market. That was two, the beginning of 2002. And if yeah. you recall that period oh, of yeah. time, that was right after 9-11. Yep. And it was really, really tough. I had essentially no choice because there were no jobs. There were no VP marketing <coughs> jobs available in 2002. Uh, I didn't really have much of a choice except to kind of write and speak and and, and, and jump up and down about these ideas that I felt pretty strongly about, you know, and um, the idea that, that on the web you already publish, you know, put out great content, you're great. If you put out crap, you're crappy. And people, um, it seemed to, to resonate fairly early as it, as it, uh, uh, when it came out, but there was so much pushback back in 07 when the first edition came out. You know, in, entire magazines, entire um uh, uh, sort of trade bodies. I mean, the PRSA, the Public Relations Society of America, uh, essentially poo-pooed and ignored the book. Um, you know, it, it was really, really interesting to see. And, and that's just one example. It was really interesting yeah. to see the pushback. Right, and now you're keynoting the PRSA conference, right? No, no, no. They've never invited me. <laughs> uh, you're, you're still on the outs. There's some bad blood there. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm exaggerating. I've spoken at, I think half a dozen PRSA chapters, yeah. although I have not done anything with the, the national organization. They've written about me in their magazine. We've, we've come to terms that these yeah, you've, you've are, reached are, a date kind, are kind of real and, <laughs> you know, they need to be thinking about them. But, but it was interesting, that transition from 07, radical ideas people were scared of and resistant to, to today, we're almost into 2012, Main, almost mainstream, yeah. you know, the idea of of creating a video as as a form of marketing, or um, you know, creating a blog as a form of marketing is something that I think almost everyone can agree is something that that companies need to be thinking about. Um, so, so yeah, it is kind of it is kind of cool that people are calling it a modern business classic. I think what's most cool for me, though is the book is out in 25 different languages. Wow. And we've sold a quarter of a million copies of the book in English, so it's just kind of a, an amazing number of people out there that have the ideas. Well, and, and the fact that you wrote it sort of as your fallback plan, right? It's such a genius story. It's like the Yakov Smirnoff, what a country, right? It's like, I don't have a job, I'm going to write a best-selling book. 
that is that is truly uh, truly fantastic. And, yeah, and, you know, I guess everyone. You know what? I was fired three times in my career, and every time that I was fired, I ended up with something better. Yeah. I, I don't want to wish being fired on anybody, but there is a lot to be said for having somebody force you into thinking about what you're going to do next. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, that's, that's all good. good counsel. Well, and, and to think about, as you said, just during the three revisions of this book, um, it's, it's, it's fewer than five years have, have elapsed. Right. Uh, and, and the, the game has changed, you know, immeasurably, as, as I say all the time. I mean, marketing has changed more in the last five years than in the 50 years preceding yeah. it. And, and there's no question about that. And it's, it's crazy. And, and some of these people who, uh, including us, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't raised on a computer. Uh, you know, all of a sudden you're like, what happened? Like, I didn't like, <laughs> where was the memo? I mean, it's just yeah, you yeah. Know, all of a sudden, uh, everything that we thought was true, isn't true and, and vice versa. But the good thing is that you wrote the memo. I mean, you know, no. what you and I and people like us are, are the ones that are writing the memos. We're the ones that are saying, here's how you do this thing. Yeah. Uh, and to me, that's just really, really exciting. And, you know, I, I, I kind of, Every once in a while, sort of say, "Wow, you know, how did I end up here? This is kind of cool." Um, and 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 just you know, thank, thanks again to the people who decided that they wanted to sack me way back when. <laughs> That's right. Uh, <laughs> um, but you know, the it's interesting how quickly it moves. You know, um, first edition didn't include Twitter because it literally didn't exist. Didn't exist, yeah. Uh, Facebook was only for students when I wrote the first edition, so I had to you know second you know as soon as the book came out, Facebook opened up. Um, for people who are not students who didn't have a .edu email address, and I'm like, all of a sudden the book's obsolete. You know, it comes out and the next day it's obsolete. Um, then the th uh, second edition comes out, and all of a sudden things like Foursquare and other GPS components, uh, you know, that are used for mobile marketing, you know, iPhone apps and stuff. All of a sudden, you know, they're really important for marketing. And my second edition hits the shelves. I'm like, God damn it, I'm I'm missing that. You yeah, know, exactly. And then when and wouldn't you know it, um, practically to the, to the week that the third edition comes out, you know, woohoo, we're finally current. Guess what? Google Plus. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's right? hard because, you know, the, in comparison to blogging or things like that, the, the, the time horizon of, of book public publishing is, is, pretty, uh, is pretty tough, right? I mean, yeah, it, you, it know, you have to give them the manuscript months, literally months, um, before the book appears and, and months is a long time in our, in our business. So it's, months it's almost is, a month. Months is a long time. And the book officially publishes this week, although it started to ship from Amazon and it was available on Kindle a couple of weeks ago. But, but yeah, what, what was, um, Google Plus, I think was the first or second week of July, yeah. something like that. Yeah. I forget exactly. So, you know, oh great, this wonderful Google Plus thing the whole planet's talking about and this new book. You know, yeah. it's supposed to be the Bible of online marketing. It yeah. doesn't even include it, you know. <laughs> it, it's, but that's, that's what... You can't get them all. That's why you got to have a fourth edition. Yeah, well, now I'm... <laughs> you know what? Now it's going to be every two years in August. There you go. I've Good. Got, I've, got, Good I've got a cycle. And, and the reason for August is really important. It's because... Um, again, I'm dumbfounded that the book is used in literally hundreds approaching 1,000 different universities around the world as a textbook. And they're on the cycle. The, the you know the U.S. academic cycle uh, begins in early September, so having a new edition come out every other year for the academic cycle means it comes out in August. So I'm now on a regular cycle to have it come out every nice. other August nice. um, for that for that the reason of that academic makes sense uh, cycle. So yeah, it's I've got a file fourth edition number one on the list Google Plus. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Well, you know, and that's one of the things, um, you know, it's interesting how you talk about the, uh, you probably haven't taken a lot of things out of, the, of each book. You may have changed some things, but it's, it's almost always an additive process. There's always more to do on the social web. Uh, it's not as if people say, geez, this is getting easier all the time. And, yeah. and so because of that, because there's always pressures to be in more places, do you feel like the new rules are easier to follow for big businesses or for small businesses? Um... That's an interesting question. I actually think it's easier for small just because they have more willingness to implement them and they have less people with the baggage of what old marketing – I shouldn't say old marketing. I, I don't want to imply 
that things that are offline are old or things that are offline are wrong. They're not. You know, it's totally cool to do television commercials if they work for you. It's totally cool to have yellow page ads if they work for you. There's nothing wrong with any of that, but if they're not working, you shouldn't have them. Um, so I'm not, I'm not implying it's either or. Um, but I found that small, small businesses, um, entrepreneurial organizations, uh, startups, generally have a heck of a lot easier time implementing the ideas because they carry less baggage than some of the bigger, uh, the bigger companies do. Um, but, you know, circling back to what you were saying a second ago, there actually are a number of things that have come out. Um, yeah. one, of the, one of the best examples is Second Life, you know. Sure, well, first, yeah. first, my, my the, first, the, the first edition of the book, Second Life, was like four pages or something. Yeah. yeah. You know, now I think it's, I think it's a paragraph. Yeah. Um, so there are things that, you know, that aren't as important as they used to be, and, and the book reflects that. The main thing that disappears are, are uh, you know, I'm like a comedian – you know, comedians always telling a new joke. Yeah. And in order to have a one hour set, they have to get rid of an old joke. Right. So I'm always telling new stories and, you know, make, to make the book not yeah. become yeah. the length of, of a, of a dictionary. Yeah. I've got to get rid of some old stories. So I'm always sort of looking for the best stories. There are a few stories that were in there, all three editions, but a lot of them will end up cycling out. You know, I'm looking for something that, um, to me, seems more interesting than the stuff that's already in there. Which so I'm kind of challenging stuff? myself that way. Yeah. It also means that um, anybody who's read earlier editions, you know, I'm not telling them to read every edition, but if they feel like rereading it, it won't all be like, oh, God, I've read this before. Sure. Um, so, so that's kind of cool. What's one of your favorite uh, story, new stories that you included in this version? In this version? Um, one of my favorite stories these days is, is a story... Yeah, it's about real time too. Yeah. I'm a big fan of real time. A book come out by that on that topic, real time marketing and PR. Uh, it's a story about how um, Joe Payne, who's the CEO of Eloqua, did a blog post that generated a million dollars worth of new business. One blog post. Uh, what he did was he realized that one of his biggest competitors, a company called Market to Lead, was acquired by giant software company Oracle. And so he said, you know what? I, I can define what this means in the marketplace. Uh, you know, uh, my biggest competitor is acquired by this giant software company. So Joe Payne, CEO of Eloqua, does a blog post called Oracle Joins the Party. And it, in the blog post, he doesn't in any way say anything negative about the competition. But he says, hey, isn't this great that this giant software company has now put a stamp of approval in the space, yeah. on the marketing automation software yeah. space. Eloqua is a you know, B2B software company, marketing automation software space. Isn't it great that, that they've decided that this is an important marketplace to invest in? This is fantastic. He provided some data, provided some uh, in, in, in infinitely quotable things in this high-level blog post. But the key was that he put it out instantly. He put it out within a couple of hours of the announcement of the acquisition. And that meant that the next morning when all of the stories came out and all the research reports from the analysts and, uh, you know, they ended up, he ended up being in essentially everything that came out, Business Week and uh, Bloomberg and PC World and Information World. Everybody had uh, this big fat quote or two from Joe Payne, the CEO of the competition. And the only reason that worked is because they he, is because he did it instantly then, but then he did something even better. He got his team together. This is all happening in real time and said, you know what? Let's email everybody in our database who's tagged as an existing customer of market to lead the company that was acquired and point them to the blog post, which they did. And, um, uh, it's incredibly, that's how a lot of these um, companies learned of the acquisition because Oracle didn't bother to tell them. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that was resulted in people saying, you know what, maybe I don't want to do business with um, this huge, company huge anymore. Maybe I yeah. should look at these guys. And they, um, they, they, I think they made six sales within a couple of months, totaling a million dollars in new revenue. Amazing. So that's a combination of a number of things, combination of real time, doing it instantly, don't waiting. So many people wait. So many people are on a I have to think about it mentality. and how are we going to handle this and him and haw and yep. Yeah, and let's run it by the agencies and let's get the approvals yeah. and 
you know, let's make sure and let's be careful and let's edit and all that stuff. Um, so it worked because it was real time. It worked because it was thoughtful information. It was content. <coughs> Excuse me. And it was valuable information. And bang, they put it out there. Um, and um, again, I'm just dumbfounded of one blog post, a million dollars in revenue. I'd love to have one of those blog posts. Yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm, write, I'm writing three a week, and I still don't have a million dollars. Yeah, right, right. right. I, it, you know, the work, the ones I'm writing are worth a dollar a piece. You know, sooner or later we'll get there. That's right, exactly. Um, so, so um, that's one story out of many in that's the book fantastic. that I really like. Well, you know, you mentioned blogging, uh, both in that example and, and when we first started talking. Um, you know, blogging pays so many dividends on the marketing side. You know, from a, from a storytelling perspective, from a, a search engine optimization perspective, from a humanization perspective, but yet. All the studies that you see show that, that still there's a lot, a lot of companies in every category that still are, are not are not blogging. How, why is that? Why, why are people not understanding that this is probably, if you had to pick a way to spend your time, uh, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or something else, blogging probably is the most efficient use of your time? Uh, partly, I think it's um, people already have a preconceived notion of what blogging is. I, I think people, I think we the group of people like you and me that advise companies on, on this stuff, uh, we have uh, some semantic problems. One semantic problem is the term blogging. It just feels frivolous. It's good um, you know, I like to call it real-time content creation. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there may be other ways to describe it. That's one way I describe it. The other phrase that gets us, that becomes, makes us sound frivolous and silly is social media. You know, when I talk to a CEO who doesn't know much about social media, I say, hey, uh, you know, let's talk about social media. What is your company doing? They're like, give me a break. You know, I don't Twitter, you know, who, who cares what I had for lunch? Facebook is for kids. You know, it's not that's we yeah. don't do this yeah. stuff. We're a big, important company. But if I say to them, hey, let's talk about communicating in real time to your marketplace. Let's have a discussion about that. Oh, great. Let's go to dinner. I want to talk about that. That sounds really important. So I think we have a semantic problem. And um, I think that partly the word blogging, partly the term social media is um, people already think they know what that means. Yeah. And they dismiss it. And if you, if, you, if you talk about the very same thing but in different language – it becomes different. It becomes more real, more interesting. I've noticed many times you ask someone, hey, have you ever, do you read blogs? You know, everyone's, a lot of people just say, no, I don't read blogs. I don't have time to read blogs. Yet everyone goes to the search engine. And right. you and I know based on our, you know, based on, I'm sure, your search results for your content, your blog, and mine certainly, you know, I'm getting hundreds and hundreds of hits from Google every single day yeah. on my blog. And I know for a damn, I know for a fact that many of the people who are hitting my blog through the search engines would be the same people who would tell me that they don't read blogs. Right. Right. Yeah, that's a really it's an excellent point. Uh, and, and social media in particular is a, is a difficult uh, phrase because it, it's, it's become a catch-all for so many things, right? You yeah. Know, um, whether it's location or video or content marketing. Or, right. Everybody just calls it social media, and so it's lost all right. explanatory or descriptive value right. uh, in, in large measure. Uh, exactly. Which makes it hard. One of the things that you talk about in the book that I, that I found really interesting is is this notion of don't try to find the time uh, to right. participate in social media and, and new marketing. Can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by that? That seems so counterintuitive. Don't try to find the time. Yeah, a lot of people ask me. It's actually one of the most most common questions I get after a presentation. A lot of people ask me, you know, how do you find the time to do this? I get it all the time. How you know, geez, you know, David. And it's easy, it's easy for you these. because it's your job. That's what they say, right? It's easy for you because this is what you do all the time. Uh, I get that sometimes, but what they'll say is, how, long, how much time do you spend on it, David? And they're surprised when I tell them, you know, it might be six or seven hours a week. It's not, it's not a lot of time. Um, but I, I think of it the exact same way that I think of exercise, and I have chosen to make exercise, a regular, regular exercise, a part of my life. Every morning, sometimes very early, like this morning, I started at 5 a.m., I, I spent an hour on, the, on my elliptical machine. I love my elliptical machine. It doesn't really feel like exercise. 
And I don't find the time for it. I've made it part of my life. I've made it part of my lifestyle. I just, I just do it. I don't even think about it anymore. It's yeah. early in the morning before I take my shower. I get on the machine for an hour, and I do my exercise. And I, it's the same thing with how I personally participate with social networks. It's not like I'm trying to find time. Oh, my God, it's 3 o'clock today. You know, I budgeted half hour to do my, uh, you know, do my, my tweeting right now. It's not at all. It's just I've made, you know, blogging and tweeting and doing videos and whatnot part of my life, and it doesn't even feel like I'm finding the time because it's part of my life. And I think anyone who's done it that way, whether, whether it's exercise or social media, it doesn't matter. Anyone who's done it that way has generally worked out for them. But people who like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to the health club today, it often doesn't work out. And yep. people say, yeah, you know, um, every Thursday at 3 o'clock I do a blog post. It might work for some people, but for most, they might do it for a couple of weeks and they'll, they'll stop. Yep, absolutely. I actually have moved to the treadmill desk uh, <laughs> for that. In fact, I'm standing, you know on the treadmill. One? I'm standing on the treadmill right now talking to you. Oh, it's, wow. not, it's not going because it's too loud. Uh, to do videos, but uh, but I, I use it uh, all the time, all, every day. I do a few miles wow. a day while I'm uh, while I'm typing, while I'm doing PowerPoints. Wow. Good for you. Good um, for you. See, you made a part of your life. I did. So well, you it's just, it's you just can actually blog and run on the tre- treadmill at the same time. You can't so run, but you, can, you can't run. Walk, you can right? definitely walk. I can definitely <laughs> walk. I can't run and type, but I can I can walk and type definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, well, it you works. Can double it's just, up. Uh, yeah, multitasking, baby. Absolutely. Well, I'm <laughs> delighted. That the third uh, edition is uh, is out. Well, I probably as soon as this video comes out, it'll be out. So we'll make sure uh, yeah. we link that up. It is the new rules of marketing and PR. If you think you've read it in the past, check out this new version. A bunch of cool new stuff in there, good stories, and a lot of updates on new tools and opportunities. The man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> David Meerman Scott joins us. Thanks so much for your time, as always. Thanks so much, Jerry. Really appreciate it. Really fun talking to you. Take care.